God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard Monday through Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Join him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord, right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. The staff of K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network is proud to announce that our very own Rowdy Rick Robinson has been selected as one of the top conservative talk show hosts in the nation for his program, America Off the Rail. Again, congratulations to Rowdy Rick Robinson for a job well done and another reason to stay connected to K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. Past programs of God's Pure Word of Faith, go to www.spreaker.com. That's Spreaker, S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. In the search box at the top of the page, enter my name, Richard Harden, H-A-R-D-I-N, and click on it. A picture with a cross and God's Pure Word of Faith, Richard Harden, will show up. Click on the picture of the cross. A listing of all the past programs will then show up. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. You're listening to God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden. Richard will guide you through the Bible and help you find God's purpose for your life. Now here's teacher and author Richard Harden. Praise the Lord. Welcome again to God's Pure Word of Faith. And I want to start again by thanking God and the management of K98talk.com for this great opportunity to share God's Word with you today. I'm going to be sharing with you about a kind of controversial, maybe a little touchy subject today called election. I listen to a lot of radio programs, TV programs, especially as I'm driving around the city, something like that. I I tune across and listen to as many radio programs as I can, um, different messages. And I was uh, listening to Dr. R.C. Sproul the other day. If you're not familiar with him, he's a co-pastor of St. Andrew's Chapel in Sanford, Florida, and also founder of Legionnaire Ministries. Now, Dr. Sproul was uh, talking about a message or a discussion he was going to have to have with his students about, you know, uh, belief in God and trust and faith in God and like this. And uh, he, he was going to class, that was years ago, when he first became a teacher or something like that in the early days. And so he didn't know for sure how to get started. So when he got there, he said he'd uh, just read out of what's called the Westminster Confession, Section 3, Article 3, or Paragraph 3, whichever particular copy you get and how they organize it. He read Article 3 of Westminster Confession, and it has to do with predestination or election. And uh, in that, it states that prior to our birth, God predestines or elects people according to whether they're going to heaven or hell or not. He elects some to go to heaven, 
he elects others to go to hell and during the people's time here on earth they have uh, no choice or they, they there's nothing they can do to change their status if they're elected to go to heaven they're going to go to heaven some way or another God's going to work in their life you know to bring them to the point of going to heaven if he's elected them to go to hell they're going to be born and whatever they do here on earth they're going to wind up going to hell now that's that I, I wasn't familiar with the Westminster Confession so I looked it up on the internet and looked at several different copies and everything to make sure that I was getting the you know the truth about it and everything and that's what that article says now he said he started the class by reading this article three and then he asked him give me a show of hands how many of you believe this he said about 70 percent of the students in the class raised their hand they believed it that left the other 30 percent which he asked didn't believe it you know naturally they raised their hands and he said well then you're all atheist and they were shocked he was telling them if they didn't believe that because uh, it being in the Westminster Confession and saying that God predestines people to heaven or hell he says this is God's sovereignty in electing people and he does that and so he just came right out and said that uh, that belief then that if you don't believe that then you're an atheist you don't believe in the sovereignty of God well I've had a previous broadcast here back in April if you'd like to go back and look at the podcast and everything and get a, a full view of this particular sub well if, you know more information about it where God loved Esau now most people will say that God hated Esau but I showed in that particular broadcast where Esau's life God blessed him every day of his life God blessed him with a homeland Mount Seir uh, while he was also working in Jacob's life his twin brother to uh, bring about the children of Israel and you know work in Jacob's life but he was blessing Esau all during that time too and he protected all of Esau's descendants for about four or five hundred years after the man Esau died and they attacked uh, some, the children of Israel and kill some of them and that caused God to put a curse on them because he promised to Abraham and his descendants that I'll bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you and since uh, uh, Esau's descendants killed some of the children of Israel that brought a curse on Esau's descendants about four or five hundred years after Esau had already died now in showing that God blessed him all of his life and like this and everything uh, there was also you know a verse in Malachi chapter 1 which has been misinterpreted and everything but anyway showing in that particular if you want to go back and uh, listen to that it's God loved Esau back about April uh, middle of April somewhere uh, I go through and discuss this and I'm going to just discuss about the election a lot more verses on that today but first I want to share with you about my website or my books uh, in fact I have a book God loved Esau which talks about election and everything in it too but I have written six books and I'm going to play you this information here about the website and I'll be right back then to uh, share with you today's message visit Richard's website at raharden.com that's the world wide web at r-a-h-a-r-d-i-n dot com at his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. Welcome back. As I was discussing just a or so ago I showed in my book God loved Esau that God did not hate Esau nor did he ever say that he hated Esau now since that's the case then we need to take a look at 
um, the Apostle Paul's teaching of election, which is um, kind of based on God's relationship with Esau, because Paul starts out uh, quoting Malachi, part of Malachi chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, which appears to say that God hated Esau in his teachings, which start in Romans chapter 9, verses 10 through 14. He starts out quoting some of this back there, talking about Esau. Now, Calvinist, which this is referred to, people that believe that uh, God predestines people to heaven or hell prior to birth, and that there's no change that they can make here on earth, regardless of what they do, to change that election, called Calvinist, and um, use the Apostle Paul's teaching as a foundation for a belief that God elects prior to birth everyone who is to be saved and rejects others to hell without you know, any change. The Apostle Paul starts in Romans chapter 9, verses 10 to 14. And I'll read this to you now. And not only this, but when Rebekah. Now, Rebekah was Isaac's wife. And, um, you know, it's Abraham, Sarah. And then Abraham's uh, son of promise was Isaac. He had another earlier son with a maid uh, or a servant, Ishmael, but he wasn't the son of promise. We'll see later that makes a lot of difference. You know, the son of promise for Abraham was Isaac, then Rebekah. Now, when Rebekah got pregnant, God came to her or, and said to Rebekah, and not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children not being yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. And it was said to her, The elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. Well, what it's saying here is the purpose of God. Now, what was the purpose of God in this situation when he was coming to uh, Rebecca and speaking to her? It wasn't about salvation. It wasn't about whether... Um, the twins that were in her womb were, you know, going to be servants to God or, you know, what their spiritual relationship was going to be with God and anything. It was about the service that they were going to perform. And it says here, before they had done any works, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. So he was he was picking the one that he was going to use to be the bloodline of the children of Israel. And he was he chose the younger one. Esau was the older, came out first, and then Jacob second. Now, it says in his discussion here then, or in the words he said, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said to her, God spoke to her, it, the elder shall serve the younger, see. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Now this is what uh, Paul was quoting from uh, back in Malachi, which I showed in my uh, previous message on God loved Esau. That that was not what God said, but that's what he was telling the children of Israel that they were telling about him, a lie about him, and he was trying to straighten it out because he said, I loved you. I, I, never hated anybody. Anyway, and that's why Apostle Paul says, is there any unrighteousness with God? Because God is not a respecter of person to just hate some people and to not hate, or, you know, to, he never hated anybody. He loves everybody. In, uh, let's see. James 2.9, it says, But if we have respect of persons, we commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. If we have respect of persons, it's sin. And Second Chronicles 19.7, Wherefore now let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it. There is no iniquity in the Lord our God, nor respect of persons, nor taking gifts. You can't buy him off or something like that, but he's not a respecter of persons. And in Acts, Peter says, 
of a truth, I perceive it. God is no respecter of persons. So uh, he didn't have respect of persons as far as their spiritual condition to him. But he does pick people for different type services because we couldn't all do the same thing. In fact, we all have such a special calling in uh, let's see, Second Timothy Second Timothy one nine says he's saved us and called us to a holy calling, not according to our works, see, just like he said here, not according to their works. He's got a special calling. He saved us, called us to a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. See his own purpose again here. Purpose and grace created in Christ Jesus before the world began. So see, each of us have a holy calling, not according to our works, but his purpose now in our life is this holy calling for each of us. And that's why it's saying here that the purpose of God according to election might stand. We're elected to works. We're elected to service. Now, Paul was one of the most uh, educated men of his day. And he had been taught by the best Jewish scholars before he became a Christian. He knew and understood enough of the Old Testament scriptures along what Jesus had directly taught him since then to know that God is not a respecter of persons. God respects faith. He, God respects those who will respect his word because, see, God and his word are the same. In uh, uh, John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was God, and the word was God. The word is God. See, that's why he respects those of people who will accept and obey his word. Romans ten seventeen. so in faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. And uh, it's not just intellectual hearing. Psalms 119.9 says that wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to that word. See, that's why the only way we can be pleasing to God is through acceptance and obedience to his word to faith. Now, that was a call to service he had for Jacob to be the bloodline of his people. If we go on then and, and, and look in through here, the doctrine then of election takes this and, and takes election then or the selection of Esau and, and over the older brother, excuse me, the selection of Jacob over the older brother Esau to be, you know, uh, that God is elected like for salvation. And that's not true. It's, it's service because we're going to look at a couple of these uh, verses now in uh, First Peter, chapter one, verse ten. He says here, "Make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fail." Now, see, if election meant predestination to salvation determined prior to birth, there would be no reason for Peter to include election in this verse. Make sure your calling and election are sure. To make sure your election is sure. It'd be impossible for an elected person to fail, because he's saying here that you need to make sure your calling and election is sure. For if you do that, then you'll never fail. You'll have that confidence and everything of your election and all that. Well, if you're predestined ahead of time, there's no way for your, you know, election to fail. Now, Apostle Paul states in Second Timothy two ten, therefore I ensure all. Th Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. See, he's saying, along with them being God's elect, he said, that they might also obtain salvation through Jesus. And that's in Second Timothy 2.10. So, you know, if elect meant that they were going to be saved on earth, you know, prior to, you know, their birth, and uh, it was already set and fixed, Paul wouldn't say that they may also obtain salvation, because he's talking about the elect. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain salvation. See, that, that would be silly to say that, because they're already saved, they, because you call them elect. But see, elect is talking about the service, it's not talking about the salvation. Now, in Second Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10, Paul says the reason people perish is not because of, you know, God has determined ahead of time, you know, one way or another, that, and that 
decided that they're going to you know go to hell. He says, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs of lying wonder and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness with them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. See, God has promised to bring everybody to a knowledge of him. In uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 20, it says, We're all without excuse, Apostle Paul says. And also in Titus 2.11, it says, The grace of God that bringeth salvation appeared to all men. But see, what Paul is saying here because they reject the love of the truth. When God brings them to a knowledge of salvation, they reject it and don't accept him. Like Hebrews 4 2 says, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached unto them did not profit them, not being mixed in faith in them that heard it. See, when you hear God's word and you hear about salvation, you hear that you're a sinner, that Christ is the answer, that you need to humble yourself and invite Jesus to come into your heart, you got to do it. See, just knowing about it in your head is not salvation. There's a big difference in talking about something, thinking about something, and actually doing it. And doing it is just a simple response to Lord, please forgive me my sins. Please come into my heart and save me, and I commit my life to you. See, it comes from your positive response into God's Word. Um, and God's Word, He and His Word are the same. So uh, if we look in here then, in the first part of chapter 9 of Romans, Paul mentions his continual sorrow in his heart for the kinsmen of the flesh. Paul believed election, if he believed election had to do with salvation, it'd be useless for him to be concerned about, you know, their salvation. Because they'd already be determined, you know, and predestined. But he's saying he has continual sorrow for the hearts of his kinsmen that they might turn and also receive the Lord. Now, also in 1 Timothy 5.21. Now this clearly points out that Paul being, you know, such an intelligent man as he was from, from the things that he had learned of the Old Testament in his teachings and everything, the scriptures and all this. But then when Jesus um, opened his eyes and got him on the right track and said, it's me you're persecuting, you know, Paul started serving Jesus. But he still knew all of those Old Testament scriptures very well and probably better than most other people in the Sanhedrin because he was what they'd call a fast burner, really studying and seeking. He was even going out and persecuting Christians because it was uh, considered to be a cult until Jesus changed. Now, 1 Timothy 5.21. Listen to what Paul says. And listen to how he uses election here. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one another, doing nothing but partiality. You know, elect angels. The Apostle Paul would never say elect angels because he would know of all people, you know, from all through the Old Testament and everything, angels had nothing to do with salvation. Angels will never get saved. They, they aren't people. They're cr created creatures of God. Now, they could take messages to people like in Acts chapter 10, Cornelius was a Gentile, and he was, it says he's very good, he prayed always, gave alms always, and he was such a good man, his family is so well respected in their community and everything, but God sent him a vision and an angel in the vision that told him, go send after Simon, Simon being Simon Peter, and he'll tell you what you need to do. It didn't even say anything about salvation, it just said he'll tell you what you need to do. Well, Cornelius was close enough to God and everything like that. He knew that he would better obey, so he accepted the angel's words to faith in him, the living word from God to him. He accepted. He sent after Simon. God gave Peter three visions, told him to go tell Cornelius, that Gentile, what to do. Because, see, normally they hadn't been talking back and forth between Gentiles and, uh, and Jews. So Peter then went and told him, if you read Acts chapters 10 and 11, when he got there, all he did was tell Cornelius and his family and the crowd that had gathered about Jesus. And while he was speaking, the Holy Spirit just came onto them, into them, and, and just Peter told later the uh, disciples when they asked him why he went to speak to the Gentile, he said the same thing happened to them that happened to us on the day of Pentecost. And what that was, Cornelius received Christ in his heart, got saved, got baptized. He was baptized not only into the body of Christ, like Paul says in Romans chapter 13, verse 12. 
excuse me, Romans 12, 13, where he says we're all baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. Uh, they, were, they were baptized into the body of Christ, and they were baptized with water. They got it all done right there. But see, the angel didn't teach Cornelius or tell him or anything about what he, you know, needed to do to get saved. He just went and got told him he needs to go get Peter to come tell him what to do. But then Paul says here, elect angels, see. He would never say elect angels if it had to do with salvation. But see, angels are elected to go do things, to serve God, to go give people messages, to go protect people, to guide us. The angel of the Lord encamps around about those that fear him and delivers them in Psalm 34, 7. See, angels have service uh, elections. Yeah, in Matthew 25, 41, Jesus also says, Then shall the king say to them on the left hand, when he was separating the sheep from the goats, Depart from me, ye cursed, in the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. See, the uh, lake of fire and hell it was never prepared for any people. God doesn't predestine people ahead of time to heaven or hell. We have to make that free will choice here. When we come of age, or come of age in God's eyes, that is, not a particular age for uh, everybody at the same time, but, you know, each of us have a time, you know, when God brings us to that knowledge of Him, and when God reveals that knowledge to Him, to us, about Him, we have to respond to accept and receive His Spirit into our heart. Because, see, we're all born with no Spirit of God in our heart. We're empty of the Spirit of God. That then is when we have to receive His Spirit into our heart. Like it said in the Second Thessalonians 2, 10, 11, the people that perish are those that reject the love of the truth and they don't receive His love into their heart. I'll be back in just a minute. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard Monday through Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Join him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord, right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. The staff of K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network is proud to announce that our very own Rowdy Rick Robinson has been selected as one of the top conservative talk show hosts in the nation for his program, America Off the Rail. Again, congratulations to Rowdy Rick Robinson for a job well done and another reason to stay connected to K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. For past programs of God's Pure Word of Faith, go to www.spreaker.com. That's Spreaker. S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. In the search box at the top of the page, enter my name, Richard Harden, H-A-R-D-I-N, and click on it. A picture with a cross and God's pure word of faith, Richard Harden, will show up. Click on the picture of the cross. A listing of all the past programs will then show up. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. 
At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. Welcome back. Now, I'm going to review, read those two scriptures again so that you have clear in your mind. 1 Timothy 5.21, where the Apostle Paul says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels. The elect angels. Angels have nothing to do with salvation, preaching, teaching. Angels will never be saved. Angels are created creatures of God to worship Him. God doesn't want that anymore. He wants us, His children, to worship and praise Him. So He created a new covenant. It says in Hebrews chapter 8, God, you know, didn't like the covenant He had set up with the Old Testament. It was just, you know, um, they were creatures of His. They didn't have His Spirit in their heart. They weren't children. But under the new covenant, in Ezekiel 36, 26, God prophesied that a new heart also will I give you, a new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit in you. And that's when we become a child of God now. See, we're children of God. The people of the Old Testament, what? Wasn't. But sometimes they were called God's children, something like that. But it, it was different and the relationship we have. We have Christ, the living word, in us. As, uh, Colossians 1.27 says, Christ in us, our hope of glory. Galatians 4, 6, and 7 says, And because you're sons, if you're listening today and you know you have Christ in your heart, Galatians 4, 6, and 7 says, Because you're sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son, which is Christ. He sent forth the spirit of his son, Jesus, into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Daddy, Father. Wherefore you no more a servant but a son, if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. We're joint heirs with Jesus. We're children of God. We're sons of God now. The people of the Old Testament had forgiveness and a covering of their sins. But like 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, which they, are, they got in the Old Testament. He said, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. They didn't get that cleansing. They got a covering. We get the cleansing, and more than just the cleansing of our heart and a new heart, we get to receive the Spirit of God in us. We're children of God. I see, and, and that's entire angels will never be that. And I see in the paper so many times, I hear people say, "Well, God needed another angel." Well, I sure hope that you know that whoever's dying is not going to be an angel or something like that. You know, that's not what God wants. God wants His children to come to Him. You know, uh, we'll never be angels when we go to heaven or something like that. Uh, we're greater than angels even now because we're children of God. They will, angels will never be. Okay, now, I charge thee before God, Lord Jesus Christ, and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preference, preferring one another without partiality. God is not a respecter of persons. He only respects you know, those that obey his word. Even Moses didn't get to go into promised land because he disobeyed and struck the rock one time when God told him to speak to it. Uh, so many people like it. King Saul got taken away from being a king because he started disobeying. And God had picked what he had chosen to be the, the best person in Israel to be the king. And just almost immediately he started disobeying God. God didn't respect that. He pulled his you know, spirit from him. Knowing it had King David anointed in, or the child David anointed to become king. Well, he respects people that respects him because he and his word are the same. So we can't uh, disrespect his word and think that we're serving God and pleasing to him. He and his word are the same. Now, and also Jesus, which I mentioned while I go in uh, Matthew 25 41, says, uh, to those on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, the lake of fire was never prepared for anybody. There's uh, several other scriptures I want to read you here. They aren't quite as clear as those, but uh, if you go to do a study on election, it's it's only used about oh, 10 or 15 times in the Bible. But now, in Isaiah 42, verse 1, uh, it says, Behold my servant, whom I am of hope, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. 
I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Now here it's talking about, you know, it's a, a prophecy speaking of Jesus. He's coming. He says, Behold my servant, whom I behold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. Let's see, Jesus had the spirit, well, all the way from Mary being conceived in conception. And she was, you know, the spirit was in her and in the, in her womb, you know, with Jesus' conception all the way through his life, Jesus had the Spirit of God, Christ in him, the living Word, Christ in him, the living Word from the angel to Mary, and she conceived them. Until right before he died, when he cried out on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's when the Spirit of Christ, God in him, left him, the man Jesus, alone on the cross, and he was our scapegoat type. Um, symbol in, you know, like in the Old Testament they had a scapegoat to take away the sins of the people. But during that time then he took all that separation of his heart from God that we don't have to go through anymore. See, once we receive Christ in our heart, my eternal life began 40 something years ago. And when I leave this earth, my physical body just falls off, my spirit just continues right on with God. See, there's no separation in in the physical death for us. But there was for Jesus because he took that separation for us. Christ left his heart. He cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the man Jesus in died on the cross, was buried, resurrected, and the man Jesus in was exalted. God was so pleased with him, exalted Jesus past just being our mediator between us and God, but exalted Jesus into the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It says in Philippians chapter 2, the fullness of the Godhead. Jesus is part of the Trinity now. Okay, so that's what he's talking about here in Isaiah, about his elect. But see, Jesus was elected for that service. Okay, and he sent down and he did it and he fulfilled it. A perfect walk of faith. Isaiah 45, 4. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect. Now, Jacob and Israel, it's just, you know, Jacob's name was Israel. Um, his name was changed. He said, Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my sake, I have even call thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. Okay, so, uh, see, that doesn't give us much idea there of what the word elect means. The reason I'm reading these is because, see, the best way to get the meaning of words is to study the scriptures and how they're used and everything. See, we looked at how, what Jesus said about, you know, that um, the lake of fire was created for the devil and his angels. That gives us an idea then that no person has ever been born to go there, so election could not mean that God then is predestining people to go to heaven or hell because Jesus just said that no one's ever gone there because of that. The lake of fire wasn't created for them. They go because of rejecting the love of God. Okay, Isaiah 65, 9. I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains, and my elect shall inherit it. See, the, his elect was, you know, the, the Jews in those days, but it also says that he didn't elect them because they were any better than anybody else. He didn't elect them or, and select them out, but he just had to pick someone, and he picked Abraham then. Uh, it doesn't say exactly why he picked him, but it wasn't because, you know, that it was any better than anybody else. He loves all of us with a perfect love. God is love. He doesn't have different levels of love for people. In fact, even when we become a child of God and invite His Spirit to come in our heart, God doesn't love us anymore for that, but He's pleased with us, oh, see, because that's what was created for. Like even in Isaiah's day, it said, Isaiah 43, 17, or no, excuse me, Isaiah 43, 21, said, These people have formed myself. They shall show forth my praise. See, He just created us to be His extension here on earth, and then when we leave here and go to be with Him, we're going to be praising Him and, you know, fellowshipping with Him and worshiping and everything in, in heaven and it won't be like before when it was just created beings of angels and then a third of them you know left with the devil and everything rebelled and everything just creatures he had made see he's going to have us up there with him worshiping and praising him because we choose to be there with him and those that reject him well then they will go off into eternity like a fire but it's not because of his predestination for them to do that now in Matthew 24, 24, uh, 
mentions here for they shall rise false Christ false prophets and shall show great signs and wonder insomuch that if it were possible they shall deceive the very elect the very elect see uh, those of us who have chosen the Lord received him into our heart and everything but we have special services that he's called us for here still talking about service uh, because he doesn't elect us to salvation that's we choose it when he brings everybody to that knowledge of salvation those of us who receive him into our heart now uh, well like a scripture I read a while ago you know that Hebrews 4 2 for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them but the word preached unto them did not profit them not being mixed with faith in them that heard it see faith is acceptance and obedience to God's word so when they hear his word and everything they reject it now also in uh, let's see Matthew 24 31 oh that same verse in Mark 13 22 the one that says false Christ false prophets and they shall show great signs and wonders and so much if it were possible they shall deceive the very elect see there's going to be all kind of things happening right before the rapture and leading into the seven years of tribulation and then Christ's second return after the seven years here on earth but prior to that uh, time there's going to be so many people going around with false doctrines false beliefs and things like this it says even the elect here and we are the elect of God now like in the Old Testament up here talking that God's people you know line of Abraham was the elect well I showed in the past message that we are his chosen people now through Christ because it says in um, Galatians and if you be Christ then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise and um, God had said to Abraham and to his seed not seeds as a many but his seed which is Christ and Christ is a seed in us in our heart that created in us a new heart a new life so all those today who are God's elect for service are those who have received Christ in their heart if you be Christ then you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise now Luke 18 7 says and shall not God God avenge his elect which cry day and night to him though he bear long with them see the way the word elect is used in these it's here it's not used in a way to give you a definition of the word you just have to already know what elect is talking about from those other verses that we found in uh, let's see what was it it was Timothy first Timothy 5 verse 21 about the elect angels and Matthew 25 41 where Jesus said that uh, no one was created to go to hell and go to the lake of fire so elect has to be to service here Romans uh, 8 33 who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect it is God that justifies and how does God justify us? he justifies when we accept and receive his living word into our heart see we still we have to make the choice that is not an automatic justification when when we invite his words into our heart and we're sinner that Jesus is our answer for our sin we humble ourselves and do that when we receive those living words in, into our heart Jesus says in John 6 63 my words are spirit in their life see when we accept those words from the Lord his teaching about our sinful condition and that we need to humble ourselves and invite him in when we invite his words in those living words they're they're our life then Jesus my life are spirit in the word so the spirit of his words that we receive into our heart and his life in our heart then we, we're enlivened then or quickened to become children of God with Christ in our heart now who shall say anything to the charge of the elect it is God that justifies and that's how it is then when we receive his spirit in our heart the spirit working in our heart is what we call the work of grace Christ in us working but see the work of grace in our heart is always the result of us inviting God's Word into our heart to perform that work even like in something like uh, I was smoking when I 
became a Christian years ago and everything. And I I got to just so sad about it and everything because it was hurting my testimony. I'd tell people about the Lord, and then I'd smoke a cigarette to calm my nerves down. And it, God was just showing me that I was putting out a false testimony of Him and hurting my testimony by smoking in front of people. And it, well, not in front of people, just smoking anyway, you know, whether in front of them or not. But anyway, uh, it just hurt me so much about that that I was being a false testimony. Well, see, when when God was speaking and showing me that and everything, I was receiving His words into my heart, and I was trying and wanting to give up the cigarettes. You know, I, I was in agreement with Him, but I didn't want to smoke and everything. And finally one day, long story, but anyway, to make it short, God just revealed to me. He said, I'm not mad at you, just hurt. You know what to do, and you won't do it. And that made me so sick then when I uh, it just I quit smoking. <laughs> but see, I, I allowed his spirit to come in me and give me the strength and help me to do that. That work of grace in my heart wouldn't have been there if I had blocked it out and decided, well, I won't go to hell for smoking. I'm just going to keep on smoking. See, if I'd have blocked his word out that, that I could have a better testimony by giving up the cigarettes and, and presenting to people, you know, that I could get my nerves calm through the Lord. I don't have to smoke a cigarette to calm them. But I had to make the choice to receive his words into my heart. And I struggled. And finally, you know, that just broke my heart almost when he said, I'm not mad at you, just hurt. You know what to do and you won't do it. Okay, so I did it. But even, you know, teach a class, to be a preacher, or, you know, to whatever it is God's speaking to you, you can't get the work of grace for that message until you make the choice to positively receive it into your heart. See, then when you receive God's words in for whatever it is He's speaking to you into your heart, there are living words. There are living words, the Spirit of Christ. There are living words with our life. Man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. If we receive his words into our heart, that is, then we have his life in us. Okay, but it comes from our choice. So God justifies us, but he does it because we humble ourselves and receive his spirit into our heart. First Peter 1 Peter 1.2, according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through sanctification of spirit and obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you peace be multiplied. See, so, so the more we learn about God, that our image of Him now should be that He has never hated anybody here on earth. He hates their sin, but He doesn't hate them. Ezekiel 33, 11 says, you know, God says, uh, He doesn't rejoice in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their evil way and live. Because see, the wicked are wicked in our eyes and what we call it because of the acts they're committing. If they turn to Him, get their sins forgiven, get cleaned up, see, they just Anybody can. There's not a sin on this earth that's too great for God to cleanse a person from and put his spirit in them. You know, because, you know, like Apostle Paul said in a different place, you know, where sin abound, there's even grace even greater. So uh, he wants people to turn to him. That's what he's created us for. First, First Peter 2, verse 6. Wherefore also it contained the scripture, Behold, I lay a sign, a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. He that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Now this is talking about elect and precious and everything. It's being Jesus. You know, here, the cornerstone of our uh, salvation, the cornerstone of our life, cornerstone of our whole being is Jesus. John chapter 1, no, Second John 1, The elder unto the elect lady, I see your elect lady here. It doesn't give us any kind of definition, uh, a way we can determine what elect means here. We need to already know. But the elect lady, she's committed herself evidently and um, serving the Lord. First uh, Peter 5.13, the church is at Babylon. The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, salute you. And so does Marcus, my son, elected together with you. See, so uh, this church at Babylon has been elected by God, you know, to serve someone else. Service. Nine, Romans 9 11. For the children not yet being born. Now, see, this is back talking about um, Jacob and Esau. Neither having done any work or evil, the purpose of God according to election might stand. Now, remember, what was the purpose of God in there? The purpose of God was which one was going to be the. Uh, bloodline of you know a, a God's people 
and let's see again the whole verse there then it says that uh, for the children not yet being born neither having done any good or evil the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works but of him that calleth it was said to her the elder shall serve the younger see this has to do with service the purpose of God in what he was telling Rebecca the elder shall serve the younger and it's written Jacob have I loved Esau have I hated but then um, if you look in that verse there it shows that God was just repeating back to the children of Israel the lie they had been telling about him in Malachi chapter 1 verses 1 through 3 he said I have loved you yet you say so God was just repeating back to them the lie that they had been telling about him he was trying to straighten it up and he did that to several other prophets um, throughout the Bible too when they carried his message to people um, that's in my book God Loved Esau if you want to check it out on my website um, and get a copy of it it's only about 50, 60 pages, but it's well worth it. Okay, now, the elders shall serve the younger. Now, it was talking about service there. It wasn't talking about salvation or any type of a, a relationship between them and, uh, and God. Because he just, you know, I guess when he created us here, he just thought everybody would want his love so much that he didn't create any of them, you know, like that and predestined them to heaven or hell or anything. Okay, now, in, uh, what is it, Romans 11, 6 and 7. If by grace, then, there is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if of works, then no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What then? Israel has not obtained that which he seeked for. But the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Now, it would be very difficult for anybody to really... Uh, understand the Apostle Paul there. In fact, Peter he makes comment in one of his uh, writings that uh, it's kind of Apostle Paul, he says, is kind of a little difficult to understand. But then, see, he uses grace throughout this. Every time you see the word grace, think of grace as being the response in a person's heart, the spirit in a person's heart that they've received by faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Then, in, uh, what is it, Ephesians 2.8, for by grace are you saved through faith. See, through your faith, your acceptance and obedience to God's word, that you're a sinner, that Jesus answered, and you humble yourself, you accept and receive those living words now. They're not just, you know, words on a piece of paper. The living words, you receive them into your heart. They're living. And when they come into your heart, they're alive. Jesus said, my words are spirit and they're alive. That spirit then, of those living words working in your heart is the grace of that changes your heart, the work of the Spirit in your heart. What God said in Ezekiel 36, 20, a new heart also will give you, a new spirit will I put within you. That's that spirit, you know, when you invite him to come in and ask forgiveness for your sins and, and receive Christ. He said, a new heart also will give you, a new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart of flesh, give you heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit in you. See, grace is always a work of the spirit of words in your heart that God has spoken to you if you receive them into your heart. Now if you reject them like the children of Israel did at the, coming up to the promised land it says in Hebrews chapter 3 verses 12 through 19 that they failed to enter in because of unbelief an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. See when they departed from his will, his word they were departing from him rejecting him and that's what happens when he speaks to us it's him manifesting a spirit a message in our mind that we call, you know, him speaking to us. Well, it's actually God in our mind creating in us a message. And we say it, it's a living word then in us. And we have to receive him then into our heart. If we reject him, his call to teach, or call to preach, if we reject any of God's living words to us in our life, we're rejecting God himself. Not just a message or a twix or something like that or a teletype or a... You know, you can see how old I am and everything. But anyway, like this, or a, you know, a text or something like that, we're rejecting God if we reject His Word. We're rejecting the living God. Now, in uh, when you see all this, by, and if by grace, that means he's talking about if you've received the Spirit of His words into your heart, and they're creating a work of grace in you, then it's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. 
Because see, if you tried to work for it, you can't. But see, you've got to just receive his word, his love in your heart for the work of grace. But if it be of works, then there's no more grace. If you want to work for it or something like that, try to do it, it wouldn't be grace. We receive his words into our heart, the work of grace in us in. See, so uh, you can't get a definition of election out of this particular verse here. You've got to already know and see from the work of grace and everything that it's from our choices to receive his word, his love into our heart when he brings it to us. And if you're out there today and you've never received God's love in your heart, and, and you may have been serving him for Matthew chapter 7, he says, Many go to say, Dave, Lord, Lord, have we not done these great and wonderful works? See, he's going to say, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Take the time right now to say, Lord, please forgive me. Come into my heart, creating me the new heart, the new life. Now, in Jesus' name I pray, your response when he comes back to you and sends his living word into your heart to clean it up, to create a change, that's when you're going to know that now you're a child of God. Because all the hate and lust and things like and fears that you have in your heart, he's going to take them away from you. He's going to have you a new, clean heart. We all get the same clean, new heart when we come into the childhood and being, becoming a child of God. And you'll know it. Anyway, pray and seek till you know you've been born of the Spirit. Like Jesus said, you must be born again. Born of the Spirit into the body of Christ. And no one has ever been predestined to heaven or hell prior to birth. And that's not just what I believe or what I think. Um, I can show anybody, including R.C. Sproul, John MacArthur, Arthur Pink, I can show them in black and white of the scriptures that God has never predestined or elected anyone to heaven or hell prior to birth on this earth. Now, I'll not bet with anybody, but I'll give any pastor or minister a thousand dollars that can prove to me, prove wrong, that God does, you know, predestine uh, people to heaven or hell. I can prove he does not. With black and white of the scriptures, if I just listen and, and read the scriptures with me, I'll be glad to do that. Good day and God bless you. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. The staff of K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network is proud to announce that our very own Rowdy Rick Robinson has been selected as one of the top conservative talk show hosts in the nation for his program, America Off the Rail. Again, congratulations to Rowdy Rick Robinson for a job well done and another reason to stay connected to K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. Past programs of God's Pure Word of Faith, go to www.spreaker.com. That's Spreaker. S P R E A K E R.com. In the search box at the top of the page, enter my name, Richard Harden, H A R D I N, and click on it. A picture with a cross and God's Pure Word of Faith, Richard Harden, will show up. Click on the picture of the cross. A listing of all the past programs will then show up. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard Monday through Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Join him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord. Right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network.